Welcome to the HBCU Podcast. You're listening to episode 46. If you're an avid listener or just joining us for the first time, here we're joined by some awesome HBCU grads in the form of co-host and guest. We also focus on all the great things HBCU alumni are doing all over the world. On this episode, we speak with Cheney University of Pennsylvania alumnus Kyle Adams. Kyle currently serves as Associate Head Women's Basketball Coach at University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. He's also a speaker and athletic consultant. During this episode, we discuss his HBCU experience, his commitment to supporting women in leadership and athletic coaching, and how his business helps establish a firm foundation for leaders, coaches, and student athletes. Keep listening. It's the HBCU Podcast. My name is Kyle Adams. I'm a 1999 graduate of Trinity University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, Coach Adams, thank you so much for, I'm, I'm going to call you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody needs a coach everybody, everybody needs a coach. coach you are right so um thank you i'm so excited to have you here on the podcast because you are the first cheney alumnus to be on our podcast so well, i'm on it yeah I'm on it. yeah so thank you so much for that coach kyle tell us where you are from and what exactly led you to cheney university i am um, uh, i am from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my grandmother uh, was a graduate of Cheney University. Um, I actually have her degree. She graduated in 1945. Her degree hangs in my office at Pondo. Um, and Cheney, Cheney meant a great deal in my family. You know, I remember my grandmother's sorority sisters coming over to the house as a child. Um, I remember seeing Cheney paraphernalia around the house. And, um, it just was something, it was, it was very prevalent in my childhood. And when I, when I went to high school, um, I didn't go to high school in Philadelphia. I went to high school in, um, in suburban Pennsylvania. And, when I started to think about colleges, um, you know, I, I, I'll be frank, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't the greatest student, and Cheney was one of the few institutions that, that accepted me. And I uh, initially, I, you know, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to go to Cheney, um, and I got there and I fell in love with it. And you know, the relationships I created during my time at Cheney shaped me, fully shaped me into who I am today. And I'm extremely thankful and grateful for, for the experience that Cheney provided for me. Yeah. I love my school. Nice. So you um, come from a family that, a, a legacy here at an HBCU, and I think that's awesome that you yep. have your, your grandmother's degree and um, everything. Which sorority was she a part of? Uh, she was a member of Phi Delta Kappa, okay. which is a teaching sorority. Nice. I'm familiar. Cheney. Uh, I, I always, we had someone on the podcast from Lincoln. <laughs> and so the, the, the debate is always, which was the first HBCU, right? Right. Right. <laughs> And of course, as a Cheney uh, grad, you're you're um, inclined to say Cheney. But like, give us what's the what's the deal? What are the real stats on who was here first? Who who holds the title? <laughs> what I always let people know first and foremost is I have a great deal of love for Lincoln University. I've you know I've coached at Lincoln, um, and I have a great deal of friends and. And people who've mentored me, I've mentees, um, people who I have very deep relationships with who are Lincoln graduates. Uh, Cheney was founded as the Institute for Colored Youth in 1837, making it the first institution of higher education uh, for people of color in this country. Lincoln boasts uh, that they are the first institution to 
to reach university staff. To grand degrees. That's their yes, thing, right? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Nice. I, you know, and I, I tell people all the time, both, 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 both are monumental and valuable. So I don't get caught all up in that. Absolutely. Very cool. So while you were at Cheney, what, um, what was your major and what exactly led you down the path to explore the major that you chose? So Cheney, Cheney and its, um, and its founding was created, uh, basically for the education of teachers. Um, and when I got to Cheney in 1992, um, there was still a, a great deal of spirit and enthusiasm in the education department there. And when I graduated high school, I, I had a, a, a great love for history, um, a great love for history. And my intention was to teach history. You know, I wanted to, to be a high school uh, history teacher, and I thought I may coach high school basketball. Um, and, you know, and it was really interesting. There, I, there were a lot of students who may not have been educated, education majors, but a lot of my classmates and a lot of, you know, the fellow students at the university, they wanted to give back in some way. They wanted to, to you know, be a business, be a criminal justice. They wanted, they had a spirit of wanting to give back. So that was very prevalent during, um, during my time at Cheney and just seeing that um, around a lot of our students. And so I started as a secondary education social sciences major. And I ended up transitioning when I started to figure that, you know, I wanted to coach. I started to transition into psychology. So my bachelor's is actually in, I have a bachelor's in psychology um, with a minor in secondary education, social science. And your career um, over time, it's led you to, to teaching and essentially coaching. When was it that you, um, officially kind of made the change or made the transition over to higher ed? So it, it was really interesting. I got an opportunity while I was, when I, when I was a student and right after um, I finished undergrad, I got an opportunity to come back and be like a, like a volunteer coach with the men's basketball program. Um, while I, actually, while I was in school, um, I got an opportunity to, to coach high school. And it, I'd always had a strong passion uh, for the game of basketball because it taught me a great deal. It helped me make, make sense of a lot of the, the organization and, uh, and how to prepare for things in my life. And so I, I, I wanted to, to have an opportunity to give that back and help, help, help that make sense to other young people. And so I've always, you know, I've always viewed myself as a teacher, as an educator first. Um, my medium may be history. My medium may be um, psychology or it may be the basketball court. And so I've, I've never lost sight or uh, been disconnected from my roots as an educator. But I kind of always knew that I would be doing something to uplift and um, and help people. Gotcha. And you've done that through coaching. So, and you said before, everybody needs a coach, but what exactly is it that drew you to coaching and what was it in you that realized that you had that innate ability to, you know, coach, mentor, uh, direct youth in the way that you have done? And Tasha, I think what's, what's been really interesting in my, my life's journey uh, has been the universe has used me to connect people. And, and even during my time as an undergrad, and I can even say, as I think my time in high school, um, I was, I was a peer counselor in high school. And so they, there was a group of students in the high school who would go and counsel, um, who would go and counsel students in the middle school and the elementary school. And, you know, once I got to Cheney, I was involved in a great deal from student government 
to uh, residence hall, council, to um, just various forms of student leadership. And so people always sought me out for, for advisement um, or counsel. And that coupled with what was provided for me um, as in high school. When I was in high school, uh, I started to play basketball. Most people start to play young. I started playing in high school. Mm-hmm. And so I relied a great deal on my coaches to teach me the fundamentals of the game. And as I shared earlier, that helped me. The organization that I needed to exercise in my mind to become better at the game of basketball helped me organize different areas of my life. And it helped me make sense of things at a young age. And I wanted to help provide that for other young people. Um, I've always been in love with the game from a standpoint of um, being able to teach the game, the finer parts of the game, but also um, in building teams and, and people connecting to one another and understanding how important it is for us to sacrifice um, the individual accolades for, uh, for the team and, and how to get people there. Um, that's always been very intriguing to me and um, exciting to me to see groups come together. Um, you know, people from different backgrounds and different areas and, and different thought processes bring their greatest strength to the group and create success. You know, that always excited me. And so to have an opportunity to, to come, back, come back and do that at Cheney um, as an undergrad and right after I finished undergrad was really, um, you know, it was supernatural for me. Nice. So you've um, coached, as you mentioned, with high school, correct? And yes, ma'am. And now um, you've, well, not now, but you've also moved into higher education. Which other uh, institutions have you had the privilege of coaching for? I've coached, uh, I've coached at the junior college level. I've coached at the community college of Philadelphia. Uh, I've coached at the division three level. I've coached at Eastern University, uh, Plattsburgh State University. Uh, I've coached at, um, I've coached at Lincoln University. Uh, I've coached. I've, I've had two stints at Cheney. I coached uh, as a men's assistant coach. And then my transition into women's basketball started at Cheney. Uh, I also coached at a, at a school in Ohio um, where I went on to get my graduate degree from University of Wild Grant. And when I left Wild Grant, my dream had, was always to go back to Cheney to coach. Um, you know, people who coach, you know, their, their dreams and their aspirations, many times it leads them to coach at the highest levels, at a Duke, at a North Carolina, at a Kansas. That was never my dream. Um, my dream, you know, what I prayed for was to have an opportunity to return to my alma mater. Um, but I never knew that it would be coaching women. And when I returned coaching women, that's when I really found um, – I found my ministry when I started to coach women because coaching women, um, it caused me to, it, it, it allowed me to grow in a lot of different areas. Um, and so in 2011, I returned to Cheney um, for a second stint as the assistant women's basketball coach. And then I was elevated to head coach. Uh, in 2013. And so now you are at another uh, HBCU, correct? Um, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Is this, yes, this ma'am. isn't breaking news, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not breaking news. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I was like, wait, let me make sure I'm not like telling everybody's business, but you're the associate head women's uh, basketball coach at University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And you mentioned a little bit about you coaching Um, women and how you've transitioned to that. But before we get into uh, a a little bit more, because I do have questions about that, I want to know if you've seen any type of difference um, with coaching HBCU teams versus um, majority institutions. Well, I think just uh, 
I have a very sincere affection um, for what our schools provide for young people. Um, having the experience of working at uh, majority institutions, and, and I've worked at some very, very good institutions. Um, I love what our schools provide for our people, um, and, and not just our people, for, for the, the students that attend them. Um, you know, I've, I felt that in my experience, I received a great deal of nurturing. Um, I grew as a man uh, at Chain and, and in the HBCU environment. Um, you know, there were there were people who who operated as gatekeepers and and standard bearers in my life that you know, and I talk to you about everybody needs a, a coach. Um, you know, my mentor, my and I had so many mentors in undergrad, but um, my mentor, Donzel Tiller, who was my resident advisor, I'm sorry, my resident director when I was an undergraduate, who I went on to, to be a, uh, an RA for him, he helped me develop into the man I am today. Um, you know, a lot of when people see me, um, when I'm dressed, I wear bow ties. That's my signature. And that's my, that that's how I pay homage to to Mr. Tiller because he taught us how to, to grow and develop as young professionals. He treated the residence hall environment, which you, your job as an RA, that was, that was preparing you for the professional world. You're doing programming, you're doing conflict resolution, you know, you're doing administrative work. He, he, he helped guide us and not just me, um, so many other students on that campus, um, and I talk about Brother Tiller, but there were so many people who stood in the gap for those our students. And I think that's not something that's just unique to my experience at Cheney. I think all of us have, excuse me, all of us have people who stood in the gap for us um, during our experience in school. And I think sometimes, and, and, and really in working in higher ed, although I've, I've coached for a great deal the time, I've worked in students, affairs. I've worked in uh, diversity. Um, I've worked in residence life. So I've seen sort of the holistic um, approach of student life, of the student life profession. And I know what some schools, um, you know, I know what some schools really value. And I think it's important that for me at this juncture in my life that I work in environments where there's congruence with who I am as a, as a human being and what my life's journey is. Mm -hmm. And so I find that I better connect um, in these environments. So I, I've, you know, I've loved the opportunity to not only attend an HBCU, but to then serve at these schools. And it's not, not nothing different at, you know, being at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I, I think it's an amazing institution. Um, and I'm excited to be there. I know they're excited uh, t to have you. Um, I've seen here recently, and maybe maybe it's just that I've paid more attention um, since we started the podcast and, you know, just about HBCU news and HBCU culture and just HBCUs in general and just how much more light they've been given. Um, whether it be via a Beyonce, whether it be, you know, via Jay-Z starting a, you know, um, scholarships, whatever. There's been a lot of people who've been putting light on historically black colleges and universities. But uh, specifically um, here recently, I saw something and a bunch of people tagged me um, in it on social media about sports analyst Chris Boussard, I, I think is his yep. name who, yep, you know, yep. took to social media to talk a little bit about athletes and yep. how they don't choose HBCUs and how, you know, athletes should give millions of dollars to HBCUs to support our academic programs and our facilities. Um, and I thought, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I don't even think that he's an HBCU grad, but I'm sure you keep up with all of he's all not. of this, um, this as well. So I, I definitely wanted to take this time to talk to someone who's actually in the field and just get your, your thoughts on that particular subject in general. Well, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of different ways to go with that. Um, but I, one of the things that I've really watched and I watch like yourself, um, the trends of what's going on with our schools. Um, and then it's a little bit more intensified with me working in, 
in the athletic realm. But I think I think with what Chris Broussard said, there's a lot of substance to it. Um, I think that we're at a time in our country where when parents look at schools for their children who may not have traditionally looked at our schools, they're starting to look at our schools as viable options. I think the climate of what's happening in our country right now um, makes it a, our schools much more appealing based on a lot of what I talked about, um, just based on my experience. You know, I think I think it's nice, you know, sometimes it can be nice or sexy for their parents to say their child goes to this school or big time you or, or that. But when you look at the holistic journey of, 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 of your life, you can talk about how your educational experience at Claflin, how it shaped you for your life. It just didn't create you to be an employee. It shaped you to, 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 to work in your life's journey and to work in your ministry um, and to how you're going to uplift and do your part. And I don't know that, that all institutions operate in that way. And I think that that's somewhat by design at times. Um, but I know that our schools have high value um, in preparing us to have meaningful lives where we're giving back and we're serving. Um, and, and where we can provide for ourselves and create lanes for ourselves and not just be employees, um, but also be the employer. Um, and so I, I think from a, from a student athlete thing, um, the, 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 the culture of what's going on in this country, if you're watching what's going on with the NCAA, which, which prompted a lot of Christopher Starr's comments, um, that our student athletes, I, I, you know, as an African American coach, I think it's important for our student athletes to see people. If, if I'm coaching young women who want to coach that look like me, I think it's important that they see images of of people who look like them in the positions that they aspire to 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 ascend to one day. And I think that's not just in the athletic and coaching profession. I think that's across the board. And so, um, you know, I think what, what Chris Broussard said was, was very powerful. And I hope that there, you know, I hope there's more conversation and more action around it. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I just was very interested, too, on your take um, for something like that. And I totally agree. Um, have you found it to be challenging to uh, recruit some of the top athletes from high schools to um, programs at HBCUs? I, I think I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think I have a different gauge based on, on, on a few different factors. But one of the things that I'll tell you, is that a lot more people are looking at HBCUs today. A lot more student athletes are looking at HBCUs. They want uh, they want to have a connection um, to their culture. Um, they want to be in environments where they feel safe, where they feel nurtured, where they feel that they're not just a number. Um, I think you're going to consistently you're going to continue to have student athletes and parents who look at um, who look at majority institutions as, as being better or, you know, having more resources and having, I tell people all the time, um, we have resources that are just different. And one of the things that I, I, I feel that we have greater is we have greater human resources. Um, you know, I talked to you earlier about my mentor, uh, you know, Taylor. this is going back 20. Donzel Tiller is still, is, is, you know, he's still a huge in my life. He's still, he's still my coach, you know, and I think, I think families, because a lot of it, a lot of when it goes into choosing schools from a student athlete standpoint, some of the, some of the, the, the some of the student athletes, want to experience HBCU. They want to take, they want to go on visits. And sometimes the parents aren't as open to it. And I think what's happening now is you're starting to see a real shift in that. Where, you know, parents, again, want to see their children be in safe environments. Want to, want to give their children 
to people who they know are going to be vested in their growth and development, not just for the four years that they're in school, not just because they're, you know, they're a number or they're, they're tuition, but because they're vested in, in their growth and development for the rest of their lives and, and building our community. And so I, I, I think, I think you get, you know, it's like anything else you want, you want who wants you. You know, when we go out and recruit, we want we want to go after young ladies who are excited about the H- HBCU environment and who want to come up in that environment and who want to build relationships that last for the rest of their lives. Um, something that, that's set in, you know, something that's real and genuine. You know, I'm sure that you still, you're still in contact with people you went to college with and you'll continue to be tight with them for the rest of your lives. And I think more and more young people, they want that. So are you running into a lot of um, recruits that this this was their first choice? Because I'm, I'm finding a lot of people that I have had the opportunity to speak to with a lot of our alumni engagement. I have a lot of them say, oh, this was my first choice. I've always wanted to go here. And to me, that's always really great to hear. I think that's something that's more prevalent today. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, in the last 20 years, it may not have been their first choice. um, But then they got there and fell in love with it. So we've talked a lot about you coaching and all of your experience. And uh, I think we we touched just a little bit on you uh, transitioning into coaching women athletes. So, uh, one, how has, how did that happen? And for you, what has been the difference, if any, um, in coaching women versus men? I think it changed my life, you know, to have an opportunity to give you some background just about Cheney and Cheney's women's basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was a student at Cheney, the women's basketball program struggled mightily. They were having a great deal of issues on, on a lot of different levels. Uh, Cheney, the history of Cheney women's basketball is one of the, 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 the most storied history in women's college basketball. Um, in 1982, I don't know if you're familiar with Vivian Stringer. Vivian Stringer is the head coach at Rutgers now. But Vivian Stringer was the head women's basketball coach at Cheney. And she took Cheney to the 1982 NCAA championship game. And there has never been another Division I in, uh, HBCU, HBCU who's done that. Um, wow. Who's even won more than one game in the national tournament. And so I'm talking about that year in 82, Cheney beat Auburn. They beat the University of Maryland. Um, they played, uh, they ended up playing Louisiana Tech in the championship game and lost. Mm-hmm. And this is a nationally televised game on CP- CBS. Like, if you watch the Final Four, mm-hmm. like, I have a copy of the film. And so it was really important to me, knowing that the young women at the institution that were currently on that team and that were in school when I was there who didn't have positive experiences, it was very important to me to give them um, to give them the best possible experience we could. Mm-hmm. And part of that for me was connecting them to their history. Yeah. And getting them to learn the lineage of, of what they come from. And we talked about it earlier. There are a lot of, we can turn on the television and people will create narratives about our school. And so, you know, Cheney being one of only two HBCUs in the state of Pennsylvania, um, there can sometimes be negative narratives created. And so, and, and what happens is we internalize that, you know, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a bigger issue as to why you ask why we don't see more people looking at our schools. But what I really wanted to do was to create and expose them to who they are and what they come from. And I, have, I would have those women come up and see and speak to our kids. And we would honor those women and, and, and let them know, like, 
you know, I would go to national conventions and wear Cheney stuff, and coaches would go crazy, you know, older coaches. Uh-huh. And Cheney, Cheney was this back in the day. Cheney was, you know, and these are coaches at majority institutions. Right. So they knew our history. Our our kids didn't know our history. Mm-hmm. And so I just, it was very important for me to be intentional about um, providing as much connection to our history and tradition as, as we could. And so, you know, I think, I think in a lot of different schools over the last 30 years, women's sports have been marginalized. Mm-hmm. And I refuse to have our, these young ladies be marginalized. I watched them be marginalized as an undergrad. And I just wasn't going to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've learned and grown to understanding that my job as a man who coaches women is to support, develop, and encourage women of leadership. And, you know, I, I, I became insatiable and infatuated about providing them with opportunities to lead and creating an environment where it's their program. Yeah. You know, where they could take more accountability for what's going on on the floor. Um, I think it's really important to understand that, uh, you know, as a, as a coach, you, you, you think you, when you see, when you think of a coach, you think of a person who's, you know, who's boisterous, I'm in charge, look at me. And that's not leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, leadership is helping people to see their leadership. The function of leadership is not to create more followers is to create more leaders. And so, you know, we would do a great deal. We do a great deal from a team building aspect to provide opportunities for the ladies in our program to have dialogue with one another, to start to talk about different things that they see or what's going on from a current event standpoint, for them to start to see their place um, in this world. Mm-hmm. And how they can impact change. You know, we would, you know, we're on a road trip. We're watching documentaries. You know, we're watching the great debaters. And then we're having conversations about, it. you know, we're watching different things. You know, I I, I would take our, our teams to the movies. We'd go see Selma. Um, we went to see uh, 12 Years a Slave. So, we, we you know, we go to see these different things to create dialogue bigger than what's going on um, on this, you know, if this ball is going into the basket. Mm -hmm. And then to provide them with opportunities to take ownership of the program. And I tell, I would tell our kids, listen, on game day, I want to go sit down. I don't want to be yelling, screaming, (laughs) hollering, looking like a crazy man. Because to me, that's not coaching. I coach, you know, coaches coach in practice. On game day, when people in the stands come to see those young ladies, play, they don't come and see me. Mm-hmm. And so to give them opportunities to take ownership of our program um, and what's going on on the floor. And now they may come to me at a timeout and, or come to our staff at a timeout. And, you know, we help them make adjustments and give them advisement. But it's also not far for us to say, hey, what do you think we should do here? What do you want to run here? Mm-hmm. You know how powerful that is? Oh yeah, to a, to, a, to a student athlete that's been yelled, screamed, hollered at, and told to do X, Y, and Z all the time to give them ownership and power of what's going on, and then that that courage to make those decisions and to have a thought that transcends past when they get done playing basketball. Mm-hmm. They take that with them into you know the rest of their lives and the decisions that they make, and so I, that's that's been at the epicenter of of what I've enjoyed about coaching with is being able to empower people and letting them see, you know, the, their great, the great, the greatness in themselves. Um, but you also talked about the development of mentorship. And I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest things for me to do was when we had our basketball camp in the summer, because when we'd have camp, our student athletes are the coaches. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've always looked at what we do in, 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 a, in a basketball program. We're not just a, a sports program. We're a community engagement entity. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, I wanted to create an environment where and help our kids create an environment that the kids in the community are waking up on Saturday morning, knocking on their mother's door saying, mom, take me to go see Natasha. I want to see Natasha play tonight. And that comes from the experience that they had with Matthew in camp, you know, where, where now our student athletes are the coaches Mm -hmm. and they're responsible for the instruction and, you know, the care of these young people and their growth and develop. Now it gives them a better sense of what it means to be in this, to be a mentor. Uh Um, And then they're able to carry that with them as they go forward. So, yeah, I love that, um, that you're giving them this opportunity. You, you've talked a lot about just developing the whole person as, um, someone who's an educator, someone who's in higher education, uh, someone who coaches. And I love that you're, you're talking about putting the ownership um, back onto the athletes, showcasing, uh, building the whole person through volunteerism, through coaching. And I, I think that's what it's all about. But one of the things I wanted to know, too, um, even with mentorship and and all of the the women that you've had the the chance to, and all the athletes really that you've had the chance to coach, do all of them have aspirations to play in the league, or is there a surprising number who really want to go into more traditional professions? I, I, at at the levels that I've coached, um, you know there there have been a few who you know, who who wanted to have an opportunity to maybe play overseas, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to maybe play professionally for a few years. But many of them want to go into some type of traditional profession or um, become an entrepreneur or, you know, a lot. We talk a lot about graduate school. Mm -hmm. You know, we we just actually had a young lady, one of the first young ladies we coached at Cheney, she just got her master's. You know, and this was a young lady who wasn't thinking about graduate school. Mm-hmm. But there's more. There's more of those young people who who want to go into a traditional profession or create a business or um, further their education than there are those who who want to play professionally. Or, or should I say, there are more who realize that they're going to have a a better opportunity to take a traditional route Mm -hmm. um, than to to play professionally. And and we gear a lot of what we do towards that in in their growth and development in that realm. Nice. Just taking the tools and and going out and be their best selves. Yes. So with that being said, we, this is obviously a, a passion of, of yours, just all of this. And that's clear. And just kind of like reading everything that I've, I've read about you and in the research so much so that you have a business that says is bigger than ball. And if you've been listening to this point, it obviously is because you very rarely even talk about just basketball. You're really um, engaged with developing um, leaders, developing um, just people who are able to go back into the world and give back. So tell us about what led you to create It's Bigger Than Ball. Um, it's it's bigger than the ball. You know, I've, I've coached for, you know, for the better part of 20 years. Um, and I've, as I, I talked about earlier, sprinkled in with, um, with different areas of student affairs mm-hmm. um, and education. I've always coached from an uncommon place uh-huh. um, where I things that I value are, are somewhat different than maybe a traditional coach. Um, and I've, I've often thought that, that we need more coaches who, who understand that regardless of you win or lose a basketball game, there are some things that each student athlete that you coach needs to be equipped with. Regardless of what sport it is you coach. And although my sport is basketball, that's why the name of my business is it's bigger than the ball. Because it's, this is something that's not unique to basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, 
if you're in a position of leadership as a coach, you need to be, you're, when, you, when, when those young people leave you, they need to be equipped with some stuff. They need some stuff in their tool belt, you know, and we hear too many narratives and see too many instances on television where former student athletes, when the ball stops bouncing, they can't make the transition. Mm-hmm. And they end up in in difficult situations. And responsibility for that as a coach. Because there's something during your time with me that I should have equipped you with. And so um, I started to think about that and wanting wanting to help coaches develop in that vein. You know, I've always been very vested in 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 growth and development for myself, for my student athletes, but also for coaches. And I recognize that I would, you know, I would be on the phone with four or five coaches every day. And people would just want to call and they want to talk about things that are going on with their teams and or talk about different, you know, issues that they were facing or different things they were going through just, you know, in the vein of, of our of our profession. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to provide more. Because I recognize, um, I recognize that, coach, I'm not improving. The student athletes that we're coaching aren't improving. So I need to be reading. I need to be getting mentored. Um, I need to be going to development. I need to be staying current on my craft. The other thing that, that, that had a big impact was understanding that the kids that I coached 20 years ago are very different than those I coach today. Oh, and That's a good I one. Use, you know, if I use, if I coach how I coached those kids 20 years ago, I'm not going to be coaching much longer. And I've seen a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of my peers who have left coaching because they haven't been able to make that transition. And I think what a, a lot of that, what's required is, again, I talk about coaching being very ego driven. But Today's student athletes don't they don't care about what you know. They can go on YouTube and learn how to shoot a jump shot. <laughs> they can, you know, they can go on their phone and learn how to play basketball. They need something different from you. And I think I think today it's more about us getting to know more about them and what motivates them and you know what their dreams are, what their goals are. You know, if if I'm a coach that uses, you know, that may use a lot of stuff, you know, use a chalkboard, a traditional chalkboard. Right. My student athletes aren't, that's not what my student athletes are. My student athletes are on their phone. So it's incumbent upon me to learn a program that I can use to, to get the information to them where they're at. And that excited me. Because that, because that allowed me to take ownership and power of my situation. You know, I can't just say, oh, the kids can't do this, the kids can't do that. No, I need to find something that they can do. And if that means I need to step out of my comfort zone, then I need to do it. Or I need to get out of this. Yeah. And so that helped keep me current. And I want to help coach other co- coaches to remain current. Because in that, all we do is expand ourselves. And then the, the, the other piece of it was understanding that, you know, you could get a new president, you can get a new athletic director. Mm-hmm. They want their, they want their own coach and then you're out. Right. And I would go to our national convention, Natasha, and I'd see coaches who may have just lost their job and they look like they can ready to go in the basement and put a piss because they don't know what they're going to do next. I really, took a step back and thought about how you have all this experience. You have a level of expertise. You have talent. How do you create something for yourself that's not based on a school? Mm-hmm. I don't become any less of a good coach because I don't have a school logo anymore. Right. Right? And so how do I transport all those unique gifts and talents and what makes me unique as a coach? How do I transport that to something for me? You know, that that led to me wanting to start the podcast. 
and start to tell the stories of, of these coaches and these people around sport who, who are doing unique and supernatural things in the lives of young people or you may not know about them because they're not on TV every every other day. So I, I love everything you said about that. And then now you've merged yourself into yet another really awesome platform with your podcast and, and, and sharing your gifts that way too. So I think you were about to tell me a little bit more about it before I cut you off, but to, uh, to tell <laughs> no, me. Just, yeah, go ahead. No, just, um, you know, the podcast has been, has been really fun. Um, and because I've, I've, I've wanted to utilize that platform to, to provide resources for coaches. Mm-hmm. You know, I have an episode on there with, um, with, with a web developer, a gentleman who actually created my website. His name is Umar Riggs. He's a graduate of North Carolina A&T mm-hmm. uh, and, and Maryland Eastern Shore. But, Coaches aren't thinking about how to brand themselves and how to create something for themselves aside from the university that they're that they work at. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I wanted to provide some information on 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 how to start to to think in the, those terms. Um, you know, we've had an opportunity to have um, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Emmett Lee Gill, who is a sport social worker at the University of Texas. And, you know, we've heard of sports psychologists, Mm -hmm. but many of us don't know about sports social workers. No, I've never heard the the term. (laughs) Yeah, so you you, you know, you think about a a, a young person who comes to a college and they were a very good player in high school Mm -hmm. and they come to college and they may not have the same success. And, or, you know, a lot of our students, and, and, and I'm sure that you notice, a lot of our students who come to our institutions are in some form of PTSD mm. in their lives. And they bring that. That doesn't magically leave when they come to a college campus. Right. And it doesn't magically leave because you play a sport. And a lot of student athletes are dealing with, you know, you know, if, if, I, if I'm this great player and I, this big, we have this big game and I don't, I scored three points. I got to go to class the next day and sit in front of them too. Mm. And people are looking at me, and 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 and, and so our 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 students, all of our students, are dealing with a great deal. But our student athletes are dealing with some some really mm-hmm. unique um, and challenging things in the in the vein of trying to win games, you know, and so. I wanted to help provide a platform and 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 share these different these different mediums and stories mm-hmm. with the coaching community, with student athletes, with with parents. You know, these are some things that you may need to look at as you look to look at schools for your young. With your um, since starting your business is bigger than the ball, and utilizing your services. Um, and utilizing the podcast to connect, what are some of the um, highlights that you've seen come from it? Highlights or the challenges um, that you you've seen with this particular venture? Because how because how long have you been? Um, has it been since you started your business? Um, we we started officially uh, April twenty ninth, two thousand eighteen. Okay, and. You know, I I don't come from a traditional business background, Mm -hmm. and what's been really refreshing um, has been the people who really helped me to grow this business um, and to learn more about business. And um, you know, I I think some of the highlights have been the the opportunity to go in to teams and do work with coaches. that helps their teams perform better, mm-hmm. helps their teams connect more, um, to, to help coaches connect better to their teams. Um, we do a great deal, deal of, uh, we do some consulting, we do coaching consulting, we do organizational development, and then I've had an opportunity to do a great deal of speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've really enjoyed it, all of it. Um, 
you know, to have coaches because I've I've been someone who's 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 had a who's had a coach, you know, who where I had a, a person that I that I a consultant that I utilize and helped me a great deal in my growth and development as a coach. And so for to have coaches who see the value of of taking on a consultant and, and, and seeing the value of what they feel as their experience can help them provide to better, you know, provide for their student athletes, I think is immeasurable. And then the other piece is for coaches to allow, to allow me to come in and do work with their teams. You know, your team is something that's very tribal. It's very, um, you know, it's very private. And I'm thankful that I've been able to build equity with coaches and, and administrators who feel comfortable giving their teams to me mm-hmm. and, let, and letting me come in and do work with their teams and have difficult conversations with their teams um, that in the end lead to, you know, lead to them becoming more connected. You know, we, were, we had an opportunity to work with Lincoln University this year um, and their coach, Darrell Mosley, because Mosley was coach of the year um, in his region this year. Nice. You know, we were able to do a great deal of work with the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, and Fred Batchelor. Um, and they had one of the most historic years um, in the history of that program. Coach Batchelor was coach of the year in the MEAC this year. Mm-hmm. And so for us to be connected to those programs and uh, to see the success that, that they've been able to have and, and, and to feel in some small way we've Awesome. So, Coach Kyle, this is the part. <laughs> this is the part of the podcast where we kind of like take it back a little bit because we've we've talked about a lot of the current, and of course, we want to get back to the HBCU life. So, yeah, we're talking a little bit again, everybody. I. I don't know why they would have started the podcast at this point, but if you are just now starting the podcast, (laughs) we're speaking with Coach Kyle, who is a Cheney grad and our first Cheney um, University um, alumnus on here. So let's talk a little bit about your undergraduate experience at Cheney. Like, what was it like? um, What was your time on the campus like? (laughs) It, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with when I got to Cheney, I was very, I was introverted. Okay. Um, you know, I was very introverted. I went to high school. I went to a predominantly white high school. And, you know, although I was from Philadelphia, I got into some trouble when I was young. My mother sent me to live with my father um, in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I graduated from high school and I chose to go to Cheney. And the social... Um, just the social environment of the campus, I think I, I don't think I was I didn't think I was ready for. Mm-hmm. So I was I was a bit introverted when I when I first got to Cheney, and you know at the semester break, you know I told my mother I said I don't know if I want to stay. Um, you know I'm thinking about you know I don't know maybe I want to transfer I don't know. And my mother said something that was so profound to me. She said, "Okay, I understand." She said, but I think you need to go back to the second semester and give it a chance. And at, at the end of the at the end of the year, if you don't like it, then we'll you know we'll consider making a change. Mm-hmm. And Natasha, I really jumped in, and I really opened up, and I got out of my comfort zone, and I got involved. Mm-hmm. And you know, I had an amazing experience. I built relationships that. Um, that sustained me to this day. As I said, I was involved in student government. Um, you know, I was a resident advisor. Uh, you know, I, I got one of my first coaching experiences. You know, we had, you know, the Lincoln Cheney rivalry is real. Yeah. I, so I, I heard they, about that. <laughs> they, um, we had, we had an intramural game where, you know, we had an intramural team and they had an intramural team. And one of my, you know, I was, I was chosen, to coach that team, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, against Lincoln. And, you know, Cheney just provided so many opportunities for leadership for me. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I recognized in the time that I went to school, many of our schools, you know, again, you you, you go back to the quote-unquote resources 
But what we were empowered to do was you can create what you want. If it's not here, create it. Mm -hmm. And many of our students did that. You know, I went to school with some really ingenuitive people. And, you know, we, when, you know, homecoming was, was amazing, you know, and to have alums come back and to see that great pride that they had for our institution and, you know, you working in alumni, you know, and understanding the importance of it. I've been an active alum. I'm a life member of our alumni association. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the challenges that we that we have. And when you're an undergrad, you don't see it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I just, you're just worried. You're homecoming. You're having fun. <laughs> what, so speaking yeah. of homecoming, I mean, at Cheney, what was that as an undergraduate, maybe your favorite, you know, moment as an undergrad was homecoming one of them? What was that experience like? Well, I mean, I was, I, one year I was homecoming king. I was homecoming king 1996. That was, that was fun. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, but May weekend, May weekend, is, and everybody has like a homecoming in the spring, like a spring fling mm-hmm. type of event. Um, you know, just just us having an opportunity to fellowship, and you would have you'd have everybody. Everybody talk bad about Cheney, but May weekend a homecoming, everybody was at Cheney. <laughs> you know, Temple, Penn, Drexel, Lincoln, Bell State, and so. Just really having, you know, going to school at a time where no matter where you went to school, it meant something to be young black and in college. Mm -hmm. And we took a great deal of pride in that everywhere we went and how we connected to one another and each other on other campuses. And so um, I have so many memories. I, I, you know, the statute of limitations is up. I can tell you some things, but... um, I, I just, Caney, Caney has given me a great deal, and I and I enjoy going back to homecoming to this day. Yeah, um, and, and going back and and ensuring that those that the young people that are there now are having the type of experience that we had. Mm-hmm. So. Awesome. So speaking of alumni, we always, of course, this podcast has an alumni focus. What does giving back to Cheney look like? I mean, as I, as I, as I think about it, I, I, I want to think about, um, you know, my grandmother's degree in my office when I worked there mm-hmm. and, you know, I wanted my time. I wanted her to be proud of me. Um, she passed away three years before I, I went back to Cheney, um, mm-hmm. to coach, but I wanted her to be proud of me. Um, I understood the importance of, um, you know, and I talk about, you asked me about my experience. Those young people I recruited to that campus, those young ladies I recruited, they had a job to ensure that they had, they had an experience equivalent, if not better, than the one I had. You know, I, as, I, as I, I was there, I, I gave all, um, you know, I shared as much of my resources as, as I could possibly share. And I think it's important for our alums to understand that, you know, sharing your resources isn't just about money. Right. Um, and you know, and I've, I've heard people say this before, but it's true. You have, you have three things that you can share your time, your talent, and your treasure. And then your time, you can, you can go and you can spend time on that campus. Um, you know, be it through any affinity group, be it through your fraternity, be it through your major. Um, but sharing your resources with that, you know, with the students there, going up and mentoring, um, you know, your, your talent, you know, what it is you do, how can you influence and help young people who may want to come and, and work in the field? Mm-hmm. You know, I think so many of us get caught up on, you know, because we get that letter in the mail. Oh, man, I ain't got it this month. And, you know, we all understand that our schools are tuition-driven and they need funding to survive. Right. Um, Especially our private ones. Think, yeah, and, 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 and one of the things is, you know, kudos to Claflin being 
one of the largest grocery, um, if, I'm sorry, not one of the largest grocery from, as it pertains to alum I give. I, like I know those, your alums give. And our, getting our alums to understand the different ways that we can give. And then using your resources. Maybe I can't give out of my pocket, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm connected to a board or I'm connected to a business that can give in some other way. Absolutely. And I think I think many of us have to have to think more out of the box as to way to contribute to what's going on at our school. Because if we don't, and I say this all the time and we talk about it, it's gonna be a sad day if we and you turn on the, the, the television and your schools disappear. Mm-hmm. Well, I love that you also said you're a life member of the Alumni Association because I've spent some time, as I mentioned, with the Alumni Association for Claflin. And one of the hardest things we've, even with our uh, alumni giving a lot, one of the hardest things is to get, you know, alums to participate um, in with the Alumni Association and the events that we do and things like that. So um, that's also something that kudos to you, because a lot of people are not involved in any particular way with their Alumni Association. I think, I, I, and to your point, Natasha, you talked about it earlier. Sometimes there can also be that disconnect with the elder alums and then getting the younger alums on board because there's a disconnect and, and different, uh, you know, different agendas and those different things. And I think more of us need to submerge our egos and, and find a way to work together. Mm-hmm. Because our elder alums have a great deal of experience in serving, but some of our younger alums have, have, a, have a great deal of knowledge from a technological standpoint, a lot of different things that they can bring to move our our associations forward well that is awesome keep doing what you're doing in that regard if you could encourage a student to choose cheney or any other hbcu what would you say i believe in the power of transformative education i'm a product of it i believe in cheney university i believe in hbcus i think we're at a time and place in our country um where it does. It gives them a great advantage to have an opportunity to be in learning environments that are committed to their growth and development on a holistic level, which gives them the empowerment, the encouragement, allows them to see their talents. That's not trying to submerge who they are, but really wants to help them to be their best self. I will never be more thankful um, for the opportunity that Cheney University has provided for me. So I'm very thankful for my experience. This one is very important because we want all of our listeners to know who you are, what you do, what you have going on. So are there any other things that are coming up for you that we should be on the lookout for and also share with our listeners where they can find more information about you? You can check out our website at www.itsbiggerthanaball.com. We're also on YouTube. I have a YouTube page. It's bigger than the ball. Uh, I'm on all social media platforms at Coach KA20. Um, that's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Feel free to email me at info at it's bigger than the ball dot com. And then our podcast, the It's Bigger Than the Ball podcast, hosted, hosted by Coach Kyle Adams. We are on the Apple uh, and Stitcher platforms. Um, please feel free to check us out, leave a comment. Um, I'm extremely excited. I have to give our head coach, Dawn Brown, who's the head women's basketball coach at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Um, this is her first year. This is our first year as a staff. We're extremely excited about um, about building a program of significance at, at UAPB. And, I, and Natasha, I'd really like to thank you just for this opportunity to share, you know, just some of my journey and experiences. Um, you, you, and what you've done with creating this this medium uh, for alums to share their experiences and show the value of uh, of the educational opportunities that our schools provide is immeasurable. I salute you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, I'm always nervous that when, you know, I connect with people and people reach out, like, are they going to want to do this? But I'm always like really overwhelmed with the response. And I appreciate people just, you know, taking out your time, thinking it not robbery to share your HBCU experience with us because um, people need to hear it. So Coach Kyle, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for your patience and everything. (laughs) So, um, again, if you missed anything that Coach Kyle said, find out more information at thehbcupodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at thehbcupodcast. And as I mentioned before, everything you need to know about Coach Kyle and It's Bigger Than the Ball will be in our show notes. So, again, Coach Kyle, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the HBCU podcast. We have so much more HBCU content on the way, so make sure you subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, and visit us at thehbcupodcast.com. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the HBCU Podcast. Like us on Facebook. We love you for listening. Until next time. <laughs>